Hello folks, my name is Romy Datta. I'm a principal product manager at AWS. And I want to check, did you all have breakfast today? Did you have some fruit with your breakfast? Did you enjoy it? I sure it was at the right temperature as it got from the farm to your table. Well, that's what we are going to talk about today. How that fruit and food in general gets from farm to the table. What are some of the challenges? How much of it is spoiled? And how Carrier and AWS are teaming up to transform that supply chain from farm to fork and reduce wastage of food and medicines. Joining me in this conversation is my friend and colleague from Carrier, Dr. Luca Bertuccelli. For the next 30 minutes, we are going to first learn about what's the cold chain and how Carrier and AWS are teaming up to transform it, utilizing a mechanism called code development. Subsequently, Luca will talk about the journey of Carrier from a provider of equipment to a provider of insights and our platform app approach as we go about transforming the cold chain. First, let's understand the mechanism of code development as it applies to AWS and the team, outcome-driven engineering within AWS, which works on these code developments. This team forms long-term alliances, which are three to five years, with large strategic customers in specific markets to solve large ambiguous problems while also achieving specific business outcomes for our customers. The customer in turn collaborates with us through co-development, co-innovation and co-investment, almost like an extended team to solve these challenges and work towards shared outcomes. The carrier AWS code development to transform the cold chain is one such alliance. So what is this cold chain? Simply put, it's the supply chain or the logistics network for anything that requires refrigeration. Top categories are fruits and vegetables, and then it also includes other food items like meat and dairy, as well as pharmaceuticals. These items are transported in refrigerated containers, also called reefers, which go on top of trucks or in oceans, or on ocean liners, as well as in refrigerated city trucks, which are slightly smaller trucks. To understand the cold chain and some of its challenges, let us consider an example of transportation of a fruit from where I live in Northern California to Japan, a large importer of US agricultural products. Let us consider strawberries grown in Watsonville in Northern California. These strawberries are picked and packed in pellets and have to be kept at a low temperature around 30 to Fahrenheit throughout. To go to Japan, these pellets are first loaded up into large refrigerated containers, put on trucks, and they travel about three to 400 miles to the port of Long Beach, going through multiple handoff points and intermediaries in the middle, where these pellets may or may not be unloaded and loaded onto another refrigerated container. Once it reaches the port of Long Beach, it could be put in a refrigerated warehouse or if a ship is available, loaded up into refrigerated containers on a ship and tra transported across the Pacific Ocean to the port of Osaka. At the port of Osaka, these pellets are unloaded from the ship and placed on refrigerated containers which are put on trucks and sent to a warehouse 
in Tokyo. From where? Through light city vehicles, refrigerated light city vehicles, they are sent to the different groceries and finally to your table. So what you can see is there are multiple handoff points, multiple intermediaries, and it is very important to keep the strawberries at the right temperature throughout as they're being unloaded, loaded, and also ensuring that they don't stay outside refrigerated environments for too long. In fact, it is not very unusual to have a dozen different intermediaries, which might even be separate companies for transporting something in the cold chain. Clearly, when you have that many intermediaries, there are many challenges. In the current state, there are four key challenges in the cold chain. The first one is around spoilage of uh, the items being transported. Let's just understand the impact of it. According to the United Nations Food and Agricultural Organization, about a third of the food produced in the world is wasted or spoiled. That's about 1.5 billion tons of food every year. More than half of that gets spoiled in the supply chain. And about a third of that, which is about 500 million tons, could have been saved with better refrigeration. This is a shame. There are about a billion people going hungry every day in the world and we are still wasting so much food. The second challenge is cost. Cold chain, like any other logistics network, is always under a cost pressure. And having so many different intermediaries and handoff points leads to silos of data, which by some estimates if shared, can lead to up to 50% reduction in cost in the cold chain. The third challenge is inefficiency, which may be inefficiencies due to equipment utilization. A common anecdote we hear from our customers is a refrigerator container has been unloaded, but no one has been notified to pick it up. Or uh, inefficiencies due to uptime. There was no prescriptive maintenance done, or no one had prescribed maintenance on uh, refrigerator containers. and during a transportation uh, session, they are they break down. And the fourth one, the fourth challenge, which has become even more evident in light uh, in the last year, is resilience and responsiveness of the cold chain. That would mean being responsive to external factors, things like geopolitical events or weather events or even equipment factors like, hey, I got an alarm saying that something's wrong with my refrigerated container. I, being a driver, want to know whether the food inside the container will stay good enough for the next two hours or so as I finish my delivery before I take the container to the repair shop. So what makes us, Carrier and AWS, the right alliance to transform the cold chain. Let's start with Carrier. They are a world leader in refrigeration, having a $3.8 billion revenue last year just in refrigeration, covering segments from transportation refrigeration, which includes containers uh, for transportation trucks and oceans, as well as monitoring of refrigerated packages or cold chain packages. About $9 billion worth of goods are transported daily in the cold chain, just in the ocean segment alone using carrier equipment. And about 15 million packages in the cold chain are monitored annually using carrier equipment. What about AWS? What do we get to the table? We have the broadest suite of capabilities in the cloud on machine learning and IoT and analytics, as well as our core strength in being able to rapidly develop and deploy solutions at a large scale. But instead of 
me talking about it. Let us hear it from the customer. So without much further ado, let me hand it over to my friend and colleague, Dr. Luca Bartuchen. Well, thanks very much for that great introduction, Romy. Hi, everybody. My name is Luca Berticelli. I'm the Director of Connected Platform Solutions here at Carrier for Duration. Really thrilled to be here virtually with you and uh, really excited to be talking a little bit about Carrier and our collaboration with AWS. So a little bit about Carrier. Uh, what we do is we really try to promote solutions that matter for the people in our planet. So what does that really mean? We really focus on two key areas. Uh, the first is we really try to preserve, protect, and extend uh, the supply chain. And what that really means is putting a great level of effort on ensuring that the cold chain, which is the supply chain for temperature control products, uh, we can enable customers to make that as efficient as possible. Another key area that we promote is healthy buildings and healthy homes. And especially as we know with uh, the recent events of COVID-19, both of these areas are incredibly important for the people in our world and our planet overall. And I'll talk a little bit more about what we're doing around our cold chain activities. But first, as we do that, a little bit about Carrier. First of all, we're an $18 billion company uh, focused primarily on three main business verticals. The first one is around heating, ventilation, and air conditioning. Uh, and the second one is around fire and security. The third one, which we're going to spend a lot of time talking about today, is the one around refrigeration, which really promotes, again, this temperature-controlled supply chain uh, for moving cargo, perishable products, uh, all throughout the world. As a company overall, Carrier has about 53,000 employees. About half of our sales come from the Americas, uh, while the rest of the sales come from the rest of the world. And roughly when you think about our business, we really look at both providing equipment that can create the cold chain, the, the temperature maintenance, uh, as well as the cargo monitoring equipment that can help monitor and track the location temperature all throughout. When you look at our business overall as a big carrier, the $18 billion company, about three quarters of our business is around selling new equipment, while roughly over a quarter is, uh, is about promoting aftermarket service and parts. But a little bit more about our cold chain role. So when Romy presented originally uh, how the cold chain really helps preserve products as they go from the beginning to as they're grown, all the way out through a distribution and ultimately to our tables uh, and in some cases to our hospitals and pharmacies, uh, these products that are moved are incredibly temperature sensitive. So when you take the condition of a strawberry, like what Romeo was mentioning earlier, uh, strawberries have to be picked and preserved at the right temperatures in order to make sure that they get in the right ripened state when they get to the supermarket so that we can consume them. Especially as we think about uh, the vaccines, like the ones around COVID-19, uh, those also have to be kept at extremely stringent temperature control. So when we do that, what is our role in the cold chain? So there are many, many different stakeholders in the cold chain. There are people that actually own the physical product. There are people that transport and move the physical product. And our role as carriers that we help create the equipment that gets sold, and whether that equipment carries the refrigerated product over the road in the form of a trailer or refrigerated truck or on a sea vessel, in which case it's a refrigerated container, we make the original equipment parts that are used to actually create that cold chain environment. We also have a business which is all about monitoring that cargo end to end, which means that now that we're able to monitor uh, pharmaceutical products and record the temperature and in some cases the location, as the vaccine makes all the way its journey throughout the cold chain in order to make sure that once it arrives, it can be properly and safely administered to a patient. Now, our role in this is, uh, is vast in the sense that there are many, many different stakeholders in the cold chain. And the cold chain, while it works phenomenally well, given the whole complexity, global perspectives, and the large amount of stakeholders in it, we see that there are still large amounts of opportunities. Even just adding refrigeration can make a significant impact in the amount of food loss every year. So by estimates from the International Institute of Refrigeration, up to 475 million tons of lost food could actually be saved if refrigeration were used to preserve and extend the shelf life. Similarly, on the pharmaceutical perspective, the IQVIA Institute that there's approximately $35 billion of logistics failures uh, throughout the cold chain annually. 
And when you start looking at all these together, what does that really mean? Not just, not only is there a financial burden, but that means that people are going home hungry and people are, may not be able to get their medications in time. And we believe we have a role to help with that. So how do we get in this journey? Um, it really is a journey that started with first being a strong brand and in industry leading refrigeration equipment. So carrier equipment on the refrigeration side for trailers and sea containers uh, and our commercial refrigeration business are well known globally uh, as being great providers of equipment. As we improved on our journey, what we found is that there was a need to take the data that that equipment was generating as it was being used and move it and to start storing into the cloud. So this really goes into activities that we would call telematics or otherwise real-time cargo tracking where the data from the equipment and from the cargo that is being monitored is actually sent live over for cloud storage and analysis. And this helped customers understand where was their equipment, what condition was it in, but also where is the cargo and what condition is the cargo in. And as you look at that journey, the next stage is where we are at right now, which is how can we start driving transformational outcomes in this greater connected cold chain? And that could drive greater customer value because if you know where the cargo is, if you know where the equipment is, you can start tying that information together uh, in order to improve and, and create tangible outcomes for customers, such as decreasing their logistics costs, increasing equipment uptime, as well as reducing cargo spoilage, not just food, as we said, but also pharmaceutical products. Now, since we're talking here at reInvent, a lot of people talk about IoT, a lot of people talk about AI and ML, What's different for us? What's different is the supply chain has some unique challenges with it, and specifically the cold chain. First of all, the environments that we operate in are and often challenging. Uh, many of our products have to be monitored. Many of the cargo has to be monitored inside an insulated metal box to be kept at those colder temperatures. Um, the RF environment is not the greatest in those conditions. We have solutions that resolve that. Uh, also, the equipment has to be tracked globally. So this means that it, it, the communication has to work whether in Europe, different countries in Asia, different countries in Africa, the United States, globally. And it has to work in an uninterrupted fashion. The second part is that we have a heterogeneous install base. And what that means is that we have a lot of different equipment that lasts for decades that we have to be able to connect IoT devices to and take data from. And that presents its own challenges along with updating firmware and making sure that there's consistency across all these products. Each piece of equipment also has its unique operating functions. Last but not least, for many of you that are data scientists out there in the audience, a key thing about making sure that these changes actually get used is that you have to work extremely closely with customers and all the different stakeholders in the cold chain to make sure that we can get operational adoption. And I'll show that with a couple of examples, but the key takeaway here is as you're developing different types of data analytics, different types of data insights for customers, in order to actually realize the gains out of those analytics, you often have to work with the operational procedures that are at play in the different organizations. And that's the best way in order for, to be sure that the predictions that you're making with your advanced analytics can actually make their way to actually result in improved uh, results for the customers. Now, how did we get here and where are we going? Really, our, our journey is one where it starts really from being able to create visibility to where these assets are and to where the cargo is. And colloquially in the supply chain industry, this is referred to as putting dots on a map because it's all about lighting up that cargo and lighting up that equipment and literally showing where it is uh, given a location. So really we start with where's the asset? Where's the asset or the cargo? What are their conditions? As we look at the equipment, how is the compressor doing? What's its set points? Are they set up at the right set points for that cargo that we're trying to carry? These are questions that a customer will often ask us. And that we can do with very simple IoT connectivity. As we go to the next level up, customers often ask us for descriptive or even diagnostic analytics, really understanding what is the state of the equipment 
and why is it in that state? So where is the asset? Why is an asset having an alarm, for example? Or even starting to look at historical trends in terms of where has the cargo moved all across the cold chain and where am I seeing across which origins and which destinations am I seeing the greatest delays? And that could be a cause of concern for a customer in order to understand how to improve their own internal logistics. As we start working into more predictive and the prescriptive areas where we start really moving into machine learning and really using AI, we start getting into questions from customers about, well, when is the shipment supposed to arrive? Can we use the information from the refrigerated trailer and the cargo together to better understand when that shipment is supposed to be arrived or forecast if a particular product is going to have an alarm problem? We can also use this information to better understand where should we help position our own parts to better serve our customers such that in the unfortunate event where an equipment has a problem, we could preemptively send a part out to make the, the necessary repair. And we could also use this information uh, across the cold chain in order to be able to understand and get a better assessment of risks. So is there a possibility that there could be not just a delay, but could there be an inventory misalignment where now you have more stock than you originally had intended? And as we get into prescriptive, this really gets into making recommendations for customers. And as you start looking at millions and millions of shipments and you start looking at historical trends, you can start developing forecasts about what could happen into the future. You could be looking at different routes and start recommending that certain routes maybe bear greater risk than others. And maybe those routes should be repositioned. Uh, you could be looking at how do we optimize our own service network in terms of improving how we get those aftermarket service and parts uh, out to the customer. And as we get into more advanced models, it's not just about the telematics data or the telemetry data from the cargo, but we could also be using it imagery and even using chatbots to engage more naturally using NLP with our different customers. So while this is not an exact roadmap of all the different things we we're doing, it helps capture the value that we have around where, what could the data bring uh, to a customer to, to increase the capabilities beyond what they have today. So an example of that is what we would do around a customer that's really trying to look at all these trends and looking to us to help supplement some information, generate some insights that helps them understand how to manage their risk in their own cold chain, as well as to manage any anomalies. So what do I mean by that? A customer that's shipping thousands and thousands of shipments every month uh, will over time create a large amount of data. And we're talking about thousands of shipments a month, thousands of connected units that are out there creating data every few minutes. How do we pull all that data together to help a customer understand based on the historical way that all your shipments have operated, the particular shipment that we're looking at today seems to be behaving a little bit differently than all the other shipments that you've done before. And what does that mean? So in order for us to do that, we step through four key areas. The first is we have to be able to collect all that data. So this is the data that's coming up from the equipment. This is the data that's coming up from the cargo, as well as external data. So customers might also be looking at impact of weather on their shipments. So we bring all that data together and we have to ingest it. As we ingest it, we have to do a few steps. First, we have to reject outliers. We have to normalize and transform the data and we may have to associate the data with different uh, data sets. The next piece is we have to be able to generate insights out of it. So it's not just in necessary to bring all that data together in a data lake, but now we also have to be able to create calculations and analytics that are able to best serve and fit those business questions that that customer is asking. So based on the data, can we start understanding where some of the shipment is, like what we would call presenting an extended well? Is the asset spending too much time at one location? Is the cargo moving, but the asset that it was on, are they disconnected? Is there a traffic delay? Or based on that weather information that we're bringing in, can we use the weather forecast to better understand what the risk of a delay is going to be? Or if some of these temperature control products are going to have a problem because the weather is going to be a little bit warmer than it was originally forecast a few days ago. And from that, we can use that information to then help feed insights to different customers, such as based on this, is that particular shipment that you're looking at based on all the historical shipments, is that going to be delayed? Or uh, should you be saving additional safety stock 
in order to make sure that you can have the right amount of inventory at that right time at the distribution center? Or is it just as simple as your ETA was updated and as a result, uh, the shipment might be delayed or maybe it needs to be rerouted. But these are all the different possibilities that come to mind when you start taking a look at how do you pull all this data together and create greater insights for our customers. Now, how do we go about doing this from a technical perspective? The Lynx platform is really the, the avenue for us and how we're really working on this together with the AWS ODE team. So as I've shown before, the same four steps that we have around raw data, the data has to be able to be generated off of the equipment, the cargo, and many external data sets. Now keep in mind, we have an install base of uh, over 1 million units uh, globally that are gonna be ultimately creating all this data in real time. And we track uh, just about uh, 15 to 16 million shipments a year on the cargo monitoring side. So as this data is starting to get pulled together, we need to be able to use different AWS managed services in order to bring that data in, whether it's using IoT Core or through API uh, Gateway, just using different endpoints to be able to access that data. Then as we bring that data together, we're gonna to bring it together in an S3 store, where from there, then we're able to drive different types of uh, data movement and uh, da different data services using Gloop uh, and bring that together with IoT Analytics and then transform and normalize that and uh, bring it together into the real heart of what we see as links, which is really gonna be developing these new insights around machine learning uh, using Amazon SageMaker uh, and uh, different uh, elements such as Redshift. In turn, after we develop these new insights, what we're gonna be doing is feeding these insights directly into applications that we're gonna build at Carrier. So these are gonna be the Carrier applications over here in the red box. But what we're also hearing from many of our customers is that they may want to be able to bring in the data and those insights into their own systems and not necessarily have to log into carrier systems. As a result, what we're going to do is push this data over uh, via API to different endpoints. And whether those end up in customer systems or as API integrations through different third party systems or via marketplaces to other sources of ingestion, or even use this data internally for our own internal productivity. All these are capabilities that we'll bring to light in, uh, in Lynx. And last but not least, uh, we have open here the ability to feed the data over to a distributed ledger. We know that a lot of customers are actively talking about blockchain and we wanna make sure that we have that capability within our own platform. Now, how are we going about building this platform? First of all, we have some key tenants that we wanna abide by. First of all, the platform has to be modular in the sense that it needs to be able to, with a microservice architecture, be able to extend and, and create new services as needed and new applications that customers may be requiring. The second thing, it needs to be scalable. Now, by virtue of being on AWS, we're gonna be able to scale up the, the different sets of uh, capabilities that we need, depending on the levels and volumes of data that we're getting today. And last but not least, it needs to be interoperable, meaning that it needs to be able to work together and work well with many different other platforms that are on the market today. So based on that, our vision is that this is really gonna be an open platform and as opposed to just a closed proprietary system. From the technology perspective, we've traditionally been a Python, R, and a Spark shop and uh, traditionally used containers in order to be able to uh, scale up these different algorithms and different APIs. Uh, we're gonna be moving a lot more with SageMaker using Jupyter Notebooks uh, and also trying to move towards serverless. Uh, and as we start developing some of the different machine learning and AI algorithms, we'll take great advantage of the ODE team, as well as some of the capabilities that are internally within SageMaker, as well as some of the knowledge that we have around operating different cold chain systems, such as equipment and cargo monitoring solutions. Uh, last but not least, we wanna build this up as an API first approach, meaning that we wanna create very clear API contracts that can provide distinct RESTful endpoints for different groups of developers to be able to easily integrate with. And as part of our platform, we fully intend to have a developer portal where people can permission under the right roles and permissions can go out and self procure uh, their own API keys and be able to integrate in their systems rather quickly. So what's next for us? This is really exciting for us. We're on a journey of transformation here. Uh, the ability for us to create this connected cold chain is largely, uh, largely 
connected to our desire to create a more healthy, sustainable, and uh, and safe cold chain out in the in the environment. We really want to make sure that this links platform will allow us to be easier to work with with different customers on the digital domain, with our ability to integrate, uh, and also the ability to create new solutions, and really speed up our ability to, to take new products to market. We also believe that by being interoperable, this capability will allow us to better collaborate with a slew of different stakeholders, our customers and partners in the ecosystem, uh, and make sure that as the data flows more seamlessly, we can create greater value across uh, the different steps of the cold chain. And last but not least, we're really looking forward to collaborate with the AWS ODE team. You know, we've been on this journey for a few months now, and their collaboration, knowledge, uh, in terms of all the eight different technologies behind it, have have really allowed us to move much, much more quickly than we have before. So Romy, thanks again for being on this journey for us, and we look forward to continuing the great work with you. Back to you. Well, folks, so we learned a lot about the cold chain and how we are transforming it today. If you want to learn more about the Alliance as well as about the Lynx platform, these are two hyperlinks you can get to, one on the AWS side and one on the carrier side. You could also send us an email. The two email IDs are uh, shown out here at the bottom of the slide. And with that, I want to thank you very much for your attention today. And I look forward to hearing from you. Please do uh, complete the session survey. Thank you.